universities and the vast majority of the population uh, and academics uh, all have a blind spot. We have a blind spot in the domain of money. Um, there are three levels to that blind spot. The first level is very old, about 5,000 years old. It's uh, all patriarchal societies in history have always imposed a single currency and have usually succeeded in imposing a single currency with positive interest rates controlled top down. It's actually an extraction device and we still have that. All matrifocal societies, societies that honor feminine values, like Egypt, in the entire period of dynastic Egypt, or like the um, uh, Central Middle Ages from the 10th to the 13th century in Western Europe, where courtly love was invented and where all the cathedrals were built. The cathedrals were dedicated to Our Lady, to a feminine entity. It was not accidental. These societies that honor feminine values invariably are uh, using several currencies, an, an ecosystem of currencies, the kind I'm talking about. Some of the currencies, which are identical to the patriarchal ones, are used for long-distance trade, people you don't know personally. But you would have a second set of currencies at the local level that people themselves create. Now, it doesn't have interest. That's actually the more sophisticated point. They have the mirage, a negative interest that becomes a pure medium of exchange, not at all a store of value. It would be crazy to store value on the currency that you have, a penalty in keeping. So the first blind spot then is this distinction between value systems within a patriarchal and, another, and a matrifocal society. Uh, that is one. The second level uh, is actually about 100 years old. The entire field of human sciences, including economics, but also sociology, anthropology, have all been completely polarized between, between capitalism and communism as two poles of interpretation of how to organize a modern society and, or an industrial society. And that polarization has created a tension on everything that's different between them. There have been millions of books written about what's different. The smallest little detail that's different between them is immediately studied. There's zero books, and actually I'm challenging to someone to find one in any language that I know, or even some that I don't know, that actually study what they have in common. Blind spot. <laughs> in other words, what's common is considered normal. Completely. Not visible. And that is the use of a single currency on the national level created a bank debt with interest. The only difference with the Soviet system was that the banks were owned by the government. In a capitalist system, the governments own the banks only when the banks fall apart. Okay? That's the only distinction. All the rest is the same as a system. So that's the second layer. There is a third layer, and it is, let's call it the academic blind spot. Uh, first of all, try to publish an article, say in the Quarterly Journal of American Economics, on questioning the money system. No way you get it published in a quote unquote you know, prestigious journal. It's so I have no problems with economics using mathematics, but they what you have, the evidence and the proof that the matrix they're used is wrong. The mathematical model is wrong for the, it's in the 19th century. Okay? So, and we're still, we haven't gotten out of it. We're still talking about, you know, the prices being formed by supply and demand and automatically get to equilibrium. In fact, you know, the same product in the same city has very different prices depending on the supermarket or the wall and it should be there according to that model. So the reality is proving us that this is actually a very abstract way of looking at reality which doesn't fit the way economics really is. So when you do an open system, then the model that we are proposing, which is a complex flow network in which money circulates, is the valid one. And we have the proof 
from thousands of examples of natural ecosystems that this is not stable unless you put diversity and interconnectivity within a particular range. So we need to rethink which mathematics are used and which theoretical framework is being used. That's the first thing. It just requires rethinking the entire economic field, which is, of course, very exciting for those who want to, to, to create something. There's a huge amount of work to be done. Everything needs to be redone. So. Economics has never incorporated the entropy. It has been attempted by uh, Georgescu uh, in the 1960s, 50s, but has never been integrated back into economics. Okay? Has never been into integrated in, in mainstream economics. Uh, I found it interesting that uh, Samuelson, who wrote the preface in the book of Georgi Skurrytkin, the author of the book Economics and the Law of Entropy, uh, he did that and basically said, anybody should read, all economists should read this book. This is, okay, let me quote more ac accurately. Uh, Georgis Jurutkin is a scholar of the scholars and an economist of the economist. Okay, so really hardcore. And no economist should be ignorant of the implications of entropy in the field because it really questions everything. Samuelson himself has not changed his book, which will run through another 20 editions without changing it. Okay. So in other words, there is an ideological blockage here. I think it's time to go so. to real science, as a real science having to do with reality out there rather than abstract models which have nothing to do with reality. Yeah. The biggest problem I see in the economic framework, besides the definition of an open system as opposed to a closed system, which is the way it's usually taught, is what do you do with what they call externalities? Okay? Well, in the economic field, you have a theoretical framework that's perfectly rational and perfectly mathematically coherent, but it is not related to anything outside of its framework. It relates only, it considers as externalities everything that's outside of it. This is a structural problem. And when you deal with structural problems, you need to have structural solutions. If you don't do that, you're just going to repeat. The cycle. What I'm proposing as a model is you have the economy as a center and you have around it the social system, the human social system, where economics is a subset of, okay? There are lots of things we do that are not economical, okay? And the social system itself is a subset of the, the uh, biosphere, okay? So the three fall into each other. And therefore, there are no externalities in that approach. That's the model that I'm following, which is called ecological economics. I mean, I hadn't invented it. I mean, there are several whole series of people who've been working with it, but it has not. That's not what's taught. What's taught is an abstract ideology which has nothing to do with reality. The reality being called an externality as soon as it doesn't fit my equations. <laughs>